Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Paul, and in this Red Gaming Tech.com video, we're going to be discussing as well as analysing tech news, which as usual has popped up in the past 24 or so hours. Hopefully, you're having an amazing day. We have lots of stuff to get through in this video. Let's start things out though with the Matisse Refresh, aka Ryzen 3000 XT series. These processors have been rumoured for some time. In case you missed it, they are essentially Ryzen 3000 as we know it, so there doesn't seem to be any major changes to the architecture. The difference is that the uh, more mature 7nm node has now meant that AMD can crankly clock frequency up of these particular CPUs. And to this end, Amazon have done an IPSI, and they have confirmed that the CPUs will be available on the 7th of July uh, this year which is, of course, a year to the day that we first saw the Ryzen 3000 series debut. There is only a listing for the 3600 and 3900 XT, and you can see the uh, specifications yourself, uh, the 3600 being 4.5 gigahertz and the 4.7 gigahertz is for the 3900 XT. So it doesn't appear that these processors are going to be exactly a revelation in terms of performance. It's going to be an incremental upgrade. So if you have, just for the sake of argument, a 3600, you're probably not going to want to plonk down the 250, assuming that's accurate, uh, pounds, which is for the 3600 XT. But for people who are yet to jump into the Ryzen 3000 series, I suppose it's an option. The thing is, though, given these CPUs are launching the 7th, it's kind of like, do you really want to spend this money when the Reef, sorry, when Zen 3, which is definitely not a refresh, it's an entirely new architecture, is around the corner? Um, I guess it kind of depends on you and what your purpose is. It's possible that we won't see the low-end SKUs in the Ryzen 4000 series uh, at launch, so I guess it makes kind of sense. Either way, this is clearly just in an effort to combat uh, Comet Lake from Intel. Oh, by the way, you should check out my recent build of Comet Lake. It features a 10900K. Uh, I'll be doing a lot more testing of this uh, CPU, but I did put out a build video because I want to really do quite a few PC builds on the channel in the future. So I'm kind of just playing around the format, to be really honest. Um, and given I want to test out AMD builds and kind of do budget focused ones as well, I think this is a good uh, place as any to jump in. But anyway, getting back to the news, AMD allegedly are going to be revealing these processes in just a few days. And uh, yeah, it'll be interesting if these pr prices are accurate because 250 for Amazon UK, well, you can get the 3600X for about 190 to 200 bucks, depending on the retailer and how much they want to gouge you. I'm hoping that these are placeholders. Is it? If not, it's possible that AMD are just basically softening us up for the potential of increasing their prices for the next generation processors. Kind of like, well, they know they won't really have any competition, especially for the highest end SKUs. Just for the sake of argument, imagine if the 4950X, uh, assuming that's what the name is going to be, uh, does actually outperform everything, even in terms of gaming. Why would AMD be even slightly uh, hesitant to not crank the prices up as high as possible? And since we're visiting Upsy Town and companies who accidentally revealed things before they should, let's move on to Asus, shall we? Because they've done an Upsy as well. And they have actually confirmed the Renoir 4000 series desktop APUs. There's not a whole bunch of stuff, to be honest, to say about these. I mean, we've covered what they are. And ultimately, if you're even slightly familiar with the desktop, sorry, with the laptop implementations, you kind of know what they are anyway. They are basically Zen 2 and use a variant of the Vega GPU architecture, albeit tweaked and enhanced and better performance, yada, yada, yada. Anyway, if there was any doubt that the Ren Renoir uh, series actually exists for the AM4 platform, it's now been torpedoed. And uh, yeah, Asus have essentially confirmed it. So it's not big news, but it's nice to see that we have confirmation. And as well, it seems like there are a plethora of different motherboards uh, which will be receiving the BIOS update um, 
from Asus to support these APUs. Hey guys, do you want some tasty, tasty, tasty Ampere rumors? Well, let's get into them because there are quite a few hints now that we will see Ampere with the RTX 3080 and 3090 launching around September-ish, which would seem to indicate that uh, it will be ready to face uh, AMD's RDNA 2 graphics cards. And a quick word about RDNA 2, if I may, actually, if I may interject. Um, I've actually learned quite a bit about RDNA 2, as well as the next-gen consoles. I'm working on a script, but I can say quite confidently at this point that RDNA 2 is looking to be very impressive. I've had several people now that I've confirmed with that have said that, uh, who have said, excuse me, that the second generation of RDNA 2 is no joke. It's really, really good. And it does seem to um, make sense in the grand scheme of things of what NVIDIA have apparently done, uh, including the fact that they've uh, allegedly cancelled GA103. Um, basically, the second generation of RDNA 2, in terms of performance, is looking to be really good. And NVIDIA apparently needed to rethink some of its products and uh, specifications. Of course, when it comes to specifications, they can be adjusted fairly uh, late in the game. For example, clock frequencies, uh, speed of memory, that type of thing. So NVIDIA fortunately were able to do that. And uh, Ampere, much like RDNA 2, is said to be a really impressive uh, series of cards. And this brings us on to some information for Ampere. Uh, the first is from Igor's lab. So full credit to him. I'll link uh, his uh, website in the video description. It is German, but Google Translate does a pretty good job of uh, translating the German language for us uh, English-speaking folks. But anyway, according to his information, and by the way, he generally does have really good sources, he believes that the Bill of Material release happens mm, some point in May, possibly early June, with EVT, that's Engineering Validation Testing, beginning, let's say, early July. And they are currently on DVT, which is Design Validation Testing. Long story short, the next stage is the one that perhaps most of us are interested in because it's working sample. And I'm going to shock you here, so really prepare yourself. But working sample means that there's actually samples that work roughly within the specification windows of uh, what the final products will be anyway. And this means that theoretically we will have performance leaks and we should be able to understand roughly anyway assuming the performance leaks do start to trickle out, what the next generation of cards from NVIDIA will be capable of. Anyway, long story short, it seems like September is going to be the launch date for the RTX 30 series, which coincides very well with what we're hearing about AMD. AMD's next generation cards once again, going by AMD's own statements and leaks and speculation and rumors and yada yada yada, do put the GPUs launching prior to the next generation consoles. So I think it's fair to say that let's say September, October ish, depending on uh, you know if there is any slight delays or whether the cards are available for retail after, let's say, they are uh, reviewed or press get samples. I think that type of time frame is going to be when we see these GPUs. And I have a feeling that they are all going to be extremely interesting. I get the, and this is pure speculation on my part, but I do get the feeling that NVIDIA will do their damnedest to make sure that the cards are as cheap as possible, because not only are they facing pressure from AMD, but they're also facing pressure from Sony and Microsoft. I've said this in a previous video, but let's say you are a PC gamer, and you're kind of like, well, I kind of want to upgrade, but jeez, I mean, spending like 800, 900 bucks on a graphics card for a performance, if Oh, screw it, I'll just get an Xbox for, for now. At least I can play like most of the games that I want. And you can't blame people for thinking like that. And NVIDIA know this. So I think they know the only way they can keep on top is 
by cranking the performance up as much as possible. And I believe they are probably going to make less money per card sold compared to Turing. With that said, I don't remember offhand, and I'll need to do a bit of research maybe in the future, um, what NVIDIA's profit margins are um, for the uh, Turing series. You have to remember, though, that yes, NVIDIA do make money per card sold, but there are other factors to take into consideration. For example, the research and development of GPUs, it's a multi-year project, like roadmaps, and I know I keep sounding like a broken record, but roadmaps last several years. So a product that uh, is starting design right this second may not come to the, out into the public until like 2023, maybe even 2025, depending on the scope and complexity of the project. So obviously that is extremely expensive. And also to say nothing about things like the actual software driver optimization and so on that NVIDIA continue to crank out. Let's say you bought a GTX 1080 card. I mean, there's a very good argument that those GPUs are still pretty damn impressive. Um, Especially if you're only playing at like, I don't know, 1440p and you're not driving a high refresh rate display necessarily and you care about the highest frames per second, a 1080 is still a very nice card. And look how old it is. And uh, NVIDIA, of course, are still releasing new drivers for it if there are, are any problems. And it's much the same for AMD as well. So I think that uh, it'll be interesting to see what the prices are for the next generation. Now I'd like to bring your attention to the Samsung 980 Pro PCIe 4 SSD, as it is allegedly going to launch in just a few months' time. Now, SSDs are, of course, going to be of critical importance, not just for the next-gen consoles, but furthermore for the PC for future games. So this particular SSD has ridiculous performance potential. Um, this SSD is capable of read speeds of 6.5 gigabytes per second and write speeds of around 5 gigabytes per second. Now compare this to the 970 Pro SSD and the advertised speeds of it are 3.5 gigabytes per second and you can write at 2.7 gigabytes per second. Obviously, I'm sure you'll agree, it is not exactly slow, the 970, but compared to the 980, it's not exactly super duper quick. When it comes to bringing next generation console games to the PC, there are several challenges, of course. One of those is the SSD in the consoles is going to be standard. If you're running a PS4 game on a PS5, naturally you could technically put it on the SSD, but it's not exactly going to benefit you too much. Therefore, you're going to use the fast SSD to run things like uh, PS5 native titles, and then you can uh, plonk in a USB hard drive to run PS4 games. However, PS5 as well can accept a secondary SSD, which of course is an expansion. And I do wonder whether this particular drive would be a candidate for that. The thing is, it also needs to fit within the form factor of the PS5, and we don't really know too much about that yet. So it's going to be interesting to see exactly what SSDs will be validated. Now remember, in the Road to PS5 conference, Cerny himself did say that he did believe that uh, SSDs capable of hitting speeds which would be usable on the PS5 will be out in the next several months. And it's also because of the priority queue system on the PS5, which is something I'll go into maybe in a future video, as there is still a lot of confusion regarding, for example, why the PS5 SSD is 825 gigabytes. But basically, the PS5's uh, priority queue on the SSD is a lot more advanced than a standard SSD on a PC. This is essentially meaning that to kind of get over that, to circumvent it, you have to brute force it by simply having a faster um, read speed on a traditional SSD compared to the PS5 SSD. So in other words, he's assent Cerny essentially said that while the PS5 read speeds 
uh, 5.5 gigabytes per second, you would need one which is faster still, such as six or six and a half, or even faster ideally, to be able to get over the fact that it doesn't have the uh, priority queue system of the PS5 SSD. Anyway, getting back to what this means for the PC, I think that uh, PCs will require a big jump in memory over the next uh, year or two. That's my guess. I, I, I genuinely feel that we're probably, if assuming you want to have like higher quality settings, blah, 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 you're probably going to need like 32 gigabytes of memories. And I also think that um, for the PC, naturally, some of the velocity architecture that's in the Xbox can be used, such as the software implementation. So it'll be very interesting to see what happens for the uh, PCs in that respect. But I think that's just about it for this particular video. I'm going to let you all go. Take care of yourselves and have an amazing day. Thanks very much. Bye for now.